How much stuff have we forgotten about what God has taught us? You see, that's what Psalm 119 is all about. This young man who wrote this, this, this song is growing up right before us as we read. He says, how can a young man be pure in verse 9? And he says, by following the word of God. That's how a young man can be pure. But later on, he, he says things that show his spiritual maturity is growing. And he's still asking the same question. Teach me, Lord, thy precepts. Teach me your statutes. He's still asking the same questions. There's no telling how old the writer of Psalm 19 was by the time he got to the end. We don't have a timeline. We, we, don't, we don't know that for sure. So, we, so there's no telling what was happening while all of this was being written down. And one thing I know that was happening is that God was speaking to a writer, speaking to an individual to write down his, his commands. And he orchestrated that to be our Bible, the Word of God. And so the Hebrew writing of Psalms actually, Psalm 119, actually is, it contains an acrostic, okay? And that acrostic is the first letter of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so each one of the 22 eight-verse sections in Psalm 119 All right, I turned it on. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm wired up twice here, so I just had to make sure I had the right things on. And so each, each section of the 22 sections of Psalm 119 are eight verse poems. And, and in that, they are started with and use the uh, Hebrew alphabet as the acrostic to do that. And so there are other psalms that are written that way. Uh, psalm 9 is written that way. Psalm 10, 25, 34, 37, 111, 112, and 145 are all examples like 119. They're written that way. If you go back and read that, you see that. So this shows... Now, I'm, I'm going to have a little fun with the musicians right now. This shows an organization of musicians that musicians usually don't have. Because I'm a musician, I can say that. You, musicians love, love to be off the cuff and plan something this way, and this is the way we're going to do it. But when it comes to writing the Word of God, somehow God got through to David in a way that creates an, a, a, a patterned teaching of God's Word. And he did it with an organization. Now the word, the Lord, uh, uh, Yahweh, is mentioned 22 times in the 22 sections. Now not, it it's not, may not be in every section, but there's 22 references to the name of God, Yahweh. And so God, in, his, in the word, really, according to several theologians, they have identified actually over 1,000 different names that are used for God in the Bible. And so, but one of those names stands alone, and that's the name Yahweh. That is one name that stands alone in its uh, entirety of who, what it means and who that is and what it stands for. Now, before we get into what the name Yahweh actually means, I want to go back to the origin of the name Yahweh. And that's found in Exodus chapter 3. And so, in Exodus chapter 3, in this story, what's happening is God is speaking to Moses through the burning bush. And he's giving him the mission to end all missions. He's giving him a monumental task. He's saying, I want you to set my people free. And he's, so this is a mission that he has been given. And so 
He's, he's getting this, and, he, and, and, and this mission is to free the Israelite people from Egyptian captivity. So the mission is this. The mission is that he is supposed to go, and he's supposed to help move the people out of slavery into freedom. That's what his mission was. That was the goal. Now look at what uh, Exodus chapter 3. We'll use the screen right now on this one. Uh, um, Exodus chapter 3 verse 13. And here's what happened. Here is the encounter of what happened. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Oh my goodness. I love that name of God. I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And that points right to us today. When, it's, when, when God says all generations, it fits us right now. So right now, if you have an issue in your life, you got a problem in your life, you got something you're facing in your life, I am is there to help you. Because he is an I am God. Not an I was God or an I will be. He is an I am God. You see, because today I need the I am God. Today I need the, the power. Today I need the hope. Today is when I need you, God. Now, I'm going to need you in the future, but right now, if you're dealing with something, it's the I am God. It's Yahweh that comes before you. The first biblical use of the name Yahweh, as we can see, is in this area, this passage right here. Now, the English language really does not have an exact translation of the word Yahweh. I don't know if you know any completed Jews or you've ever had any, commu uh, any uh, communication by email or letter from any uh, Jews that have given their life to Christ. And, and, but, but they will, if, if they're real Jews, they will send you a letter. And in the letter, if they refer to God, they will take the O out. They, they, they'll put a hyphen in there, or they'll put an underscore right there. They'll put a G with an underscore and, and D. You know why? Because they honor the name of God. They honor, and that's Jehovah. And then Yahweh is the same way. Now, in the Bible, we don't, like I said, in the English language, we don't have an English translation for Yahweh. And so what we have when the translation, when the word is Yahweh in the Hebrew, what we have, it is written in the Old Testament, we have L-O-R-D in capital letters. Okay? And they're all in capital letters. So whenever you see that, that is the Hebrew name of God, Yahweh. Okay? As it was written in hot Yahweh. So Yahweh is such a such a sacred name they the even the jewish people uh hesitated uh uttering it out loud so over time jews started using substitute names now this is not that they're less than it's just that they honored yahweh the lord so much with who he was and understanding the holiness of who that god really is they honored him so much they would come up with names like adonai which means my lord they would say Adonai, or they'd say Elohim. And so they would use other words that they understood were, was really actually edifying who God was because they believed that the name Yahweh was such a holy name, they didn't even think they were worthy as a human being to speak it. So in Exodus 14, God uses I am and Yahweh interchangeably. So not only is the Yahweh name a holy name, but I am is a holy name. He said, I am who I am. Tell them who I am. Tell them that I am sent me, sent you. So... 
we see the significance of, of the name I am. So why does this matter that God is I am? Why does that matter? Well, in the Old Testament, a person's name often reflected the character of the person. As they were named in the Old Testament, as those names would crop up, it reflected who that person was, what was the character. So Abraham means father of a great multitude. That name means something, father of a great, great multitude. Eve means living, which is fitting because she was the mother of all living things. By the way, we're all one blood. Amen. Don't care what the nationality is right now. We all started with one blood. And we're all saved by one blood. Oh my goodness, that's a whole other sermon. All right. Jesus means Savior. So the names that were given meant something. I am meant something. Names were very important. It could point to that person's disposition. It could point to that person's mission in life. It could point to even more. And Moses knew that when God spoke to him and said, Tell them I am sent you. When he asked God what he should tell the Israelites, when, when they were asking him who sent him, he, he essentially was asking God to provide some kind of credibility to the fantastic story that he is about to tell these people. Why are you going to be, why am I going to be credible to these people, he was, Moses was saying to God. He's asking God about his character. He's asking God about his, na his nature. And if we ask God, who are you? And he replies, I am who I am. That is significant. And we need to take time and understand how to dwell on the chosen name that we know him by. Do you know him as I am? Do you know him as an I am God? Do you reference the fact that you couldn't live your life without an I am God? And do you wake up in the morning giving praise to God because he is an I am God? That's the character of who my God is. That's the character of the God that we worship. God has no need of us. God has no need of us. The simple fact, that, that simple fact can be a little, almost offensive to our human nature. Well, wait a minute. For him to save the world, he needs me. He called me. I'm supposed to share the gospel. Do you understand that an I am God could speak the words? And anybody that needs to be saved could be saved without the need of us. He said, I am God. He has no need of us. It's true that God does not need us. He doesn't need anyone. He is completely whole within himself. He's eternal. He has always existed and he always will exist. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And he is the only one in existence who can be described this way. Nobody else can be described like this. Why is it significant that we know Yahweh, that we know the I Am God? Because nobody... Nothing stands up to the character of who our God really is. God stands alone in need of nothing. He's holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy, significant, and sufficient. He's also an unchanging God. Someone once said, the, there's nothing permanent... Except change. <laughs> change is inevitable. In fact, what we are feeling in the United States and the world right now is a change. Now, we've been feeling a change for a long time. 
So, uh, our, our world is constantly shifting. The values are shifting in front of us. Everything is subjective, and a lot of things seem to change on a day-to-day basis, but our God does not conform to what is going on in the world. He is an unchanging God. He remains constant through it all. It doesn't make any difference what we hear on a day-to-day basis about our world changing. But the only way for us to be steady is to worship an unchanging God. And to hear and read and understand from the book what an unchanging God can do in your life. And how an unchanging God can keep you steady. No matter if your world is shaking all around you, an unchanging God in you, the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ within you is constant it's a constant thing that cannot be overturned by anything unless we allow it in our minds to not think that he is I am Yahweh has always been who he is from the beginning of time he has always been the standard for absolute perfection and holiness and we have a choice we have a choice we either choose him and conform to him or we don't that's it there's not a third choice folks we either make the choice to conform to him to choose him as our I am God to choose Yahweh an unchanging God or we don't you see when we don't that's when our world gets shaken see the world shakes us every day stuff happens and it shakes us every day and when we can't come on a daily basis in prayer reading the word of God letting the word of God speak to us in a powerful way if, when we can't do that and let that word of God conform us to the day then, we're gonna, then what's going to happen is the world is going to conform us and when the world starts conforming us we get confused and we don't know what decisions to make The way you get back on track is to read his word, to read what the Bible says, to read his precepts, his statutes, his commandments, to read those things that he has laid down. There's an encouraging thing happening right now in the United States. We're seeing the Ten Commandments being erected back up in front of some of the government buildings. It's just popping up a little bit here, a little bit there. So do you recognize that I think and what I believe is that the Christian establishment of people are sick and tired of the devil running our world? And so they're rising up to the occasion and we're going back to the book. We're going back to the law. We're going back to the commandments. Now the fight's not over yet. We got a bigger one coming. But it's encouraging to see the the winds of that happening. Because I think for a period of time, unfortunately, God's people have sat back and said, well, there's not much I can do about it. I got news for you, we can. We can do something about it. Especially, especially if we believe in an I am God. And so we need to keep a white knuckle grip. I I use that as as a term. A white knuckle grip. Y'all know what a white knuckle grip is, don't you? That's when you don't, you hate to fly, you know. 
and you're so afraid of the takeoff and the set down, you know, and every time that happens, I, believe me, my wife, Carol, is, is a white knuckle flyer. She grabs that thing, she grabs a handrail and she's just white knuckle. When we get up in the air, we're fine. Smooth as it can be until it, you know, you get a little chatter up there and you get a little chatter. She grabs those handrails. Well, we need to be a white knuckle believer. Grasp a hold of this word in such a way that it leads and guides your life on a daily basis and so when Somebody says something that you know that is absolutely opposite from what the Word of God says. You don't have to be confrontive. You just have to tell them the truth. And they say, how do you know you have the truth? I said, because I worship an I am God. And do you understand what an I am God can do for your life? Do you know everybody actually needs an I am God? They just don't know they need an I am God. And if you can help convince them that they do, that's how you get through this life. Belinda, today, I'm prophesying an I am God over your life. For all that you're going through in your life right now, in Jesus' name, I pray you'll wake up tomorrow and you will remember that God is an I am God in your life. You know, the author of Psalm 119, it's an auto, autobiographical uh, section. It's, it's an autobiography, really. The author is apparently, and he starts with being a young man. And he's young in his writing about his relationship to the Word of God. See, this is where I think this is going to be very important for us to to know and, and understand about reading through and studying Psalm 119. Some of us may be young in our relationship to the actual Word of God. We were just talking about it a little earlier back in the back. You know, a lot of us, most, mo- most of what people know in the world is what someone else has told them about this book. Or someone has suggested a self-help book that has a few verses in it and this person has written a bunch of self-help stuff and for that particular time in their life whatever the self-help they needed they got help okay I get that but the problem is that they're gonna have to have volumes and volumes of self-help books to do what this book does in one You see, because every one of those self-help books, if they're really truly self-help books built on Christianity, if they really are, then basically all they're doing is they're getting the truth from what this Word says. That's, That's the bottom line. So you get help for that problem, but then you got another problem that shows up. You see, and he said, wait, wait, wait a minute, where's my next self-help book? Well, you know, here's one. Read the book of Job. Let me, let me tell you something. You know, if you think you got problems, read Job. And you say, wait a minute. Is that really in the book? Did all that happen and God let it happen? Yes. That's the truth of this book. And that teaches me something about God. What it teaches me is that God carried Job through everything that happened to him. He was an I am God. We've just got to get back to the book. And so this author starts out a young man and starts out about his relationship to the Word of God. How can a young man keep his way pure? Verse 9. And he says it right there. Because of his possession of the Word of God. The possession of it. That means he, it owned him. He, and he owned it. And so he had it in him. But later on, in verse 99 and 100, he says, I have more insight than all of my teachers. I understand more than the aged. You know, when you get there, you realize that this guy's growing up. He's saying, he's saying things like, wow, I think I've passed up my teacher. 
The, 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 this guy over here is trying to teach me something, but yet I am gaining so much insight and wisdom from the Word of God. It seems to me like I have spiritually matured past him now. So it shows that this young man is growing up. It may be in age, but it also is in spiritual maturity. And that's what all of us need. We all need to grow up in the Word of God. We all need more of the Word of God so that we can become more mature in Christ. And so the young man is growing. He's maturing. He says, he says my soul languishes for thy salvation. I wait for thy word, he says. He's longing to read thy word, he says. And so he goes on, and, he, and as you examine Psalm 119, you see that, that and, and by the way, I use David as the author. There are uh, other opinions about this, and, and I don't think the opinions matter. I don't think my opinion matters if I say David or Ezra or Nehemiah. I don't think that matters. I think what matters is what God put in the book for us to read. And so, if you, don't you think... Don't you just think that if God thought that was important for Psalm 119, he would have said, hey, David, put a Psalm of David in there. Well, like he did all the other Psalms. It's written in there. It says a Psalm of David, one, two, four, eight, nine. All of those are a Psalm of David. So if God would think that it was important, wouldn't you think it was important enough to say, hey, Psalm, title, I mean, hey, David, title this thing a Psalm of David like you've done everything else. You know why? He says, I think God wants this to be a psalm for everyone. It's just not David's psalm. It's mine now. It's mine now. I've read it 14 times in the last six months. It's mine now. It's not a psalm of David. I'm reading somebody else's word. It's my word. The Word possesses me because I keep reading it. And every time I read it, He shows me something different. Reading the same words over and over again, and I get something different every time. You know why? Because He's an I am God. You see, the day that I'm reading it that day, I need an I am God about something different than what I did when I wrote it two weeks, read it two weeks ago. So the I am God speaks to me about my I am thing that I need for that day. And it comes through when he speaks to us. So many, most, most theologians say it's the Psalm of David. Some say that ne uh, Nehemiah had a part in it. Some say Ezra had a part in it. That is not an issue. That's not, we, uh, we are not going to get off on that and chase rabbits on that. There's no need to do that. There's absolutely no need to look at that. But here's what I read from some of those uh, theologians that I thought were very, very important. One describes this, this chapter. You know, normally how you would read a chapter that would have like 22 sections in it, you would think that you'd read section 1. And it would connect to section 2, and then that would connect to section 3, and there would be this, this progression that goes along. But that's not the way that is written. There's no telling how much time went between section 1, 1 through 8, to the next, sec next day. There's no telling how much time did that. So this writer says, this is more, it's not like a chain, it's more like a string of pearls. Think about that. See, that's a great analogy, I think. It's more like a string of pearls. It, each one of them stands on its own. Each one of those sections are, 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 is, is, is a pearl of great price. And it's all sewn together in a necklace. And you hang it around your neck. I think that's great. Now, Spurgeon says it's a kaleidoscope. I love that too. He says... When you read the first section, the first eight verses, you look through the kaleidoscope and all of those colors are in place. But when you move to the next eight verses, the kaleidoscope changes. And although it has changed, you're seeing the same bright, wonderful colors. You just see them in a different light. I like that analogy too. 
So it's good to read up on some of this. So he says that the, the variety of how the writer has written uh, Psalm 119 is like a kaleidoscope. Now, the overall message of Psalm 119 is focusing on the truth of God's Word. It encourages us through every generation to stay close and focused to His Word no matter what happens around us in the world. That is what Psalm 119 teaches us, is to stay encouraged through every generation no matter what's happening. God's Word is powerful, it's living, and it's active. It never changes because He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His words are breathed straight from His heart to, to us in a love letter. This is a love letter from God. He's just pouring out His love to us. And His word is sharper than any two-edged sword. So I gave you an outline in, in the uh, bulletin, in the worship guide today, about eight synonyms of the word that are used uh, for uh, the word uh, uh, scripture. What is scripture called in Psalm 119? I'll go through these, these I can do quickly and we'll be done. So first one is scripture is called the law. Scripture is called the law. The Torah is the Hebrew word. Scripture is called the law. Now this word means instruction. And it, but it means instruction that is flowing from a divine revelation. So when we read the Torah, when we read the law, which is the law of Moses... Uh, the Pentateuch is basically what David or the writer of Psalm 119 was talking about. That is where we get the law. And so, but, and that was instruction that w flowed from a divine source in a revelation for us to know. And, and in a very narrow sense, it, refer it refers to the law of Moses. So here it is in the widest sense because it's, it's synonymous with the Word of God. So it views God as a teacher. We need to not only look at God as the I am God, we need to view God as the teaching God. He teaches us. If He's not teaching you something new every day, you're not asking the right questions. Okay? Just be aware of that. So scripture is also called the word, dabar is, in the, is, is the Hebrew word. It's called the word. It's called the word. This refers to anything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Now divine revelation could come in any kinds of way. It may or may not be spoken. But, but what, is, what proceeds from the mouth of the Lord is is, is a broad term for divine revelation, but it implies and it means that God has spoken. He has spoken a language that, that the people that wrote it down understood. So it must have been a human language of some sort. Okay? So, so they understood a spoken word from God. Okay? Scripture is filled with the spoken word of God. I don't know about you, but if God speaks it, I better do it. We better, get, we, we better get on board if God speaks it. Sometimes we don't delineate what God has said in his book and what, and what the writer has put down about what he heard. See, sometimes, see, this is the thing. A lot of times we get our knowledge of God through somebody else instead of directly from His Word. Okay? That's not wrong because I've learned a lot from my professors in seminary. I've learned a lot from them. But every one of my professors, and I applaud them for this, every one of them used to say, don't take it at my word. Find it out on your own. And so I'm saying the same thing to you. I may be opening up a new area for you in, in, in loving the Word of God. I want you to fall in love with the Word of God on your own. Don't take it for what I say. Take it for what God says to you. So Scripture is called the Word. 
and it, and it views God as a communicator, okay? It views God as a communicator. Now, there's another word that is a Hebrew word that's used the word word, scripture. It's Imra, and this is derived from the, from the verb meaning to say. Now, now, what is, what's the difference between proceeding from the mouth of the Lord or to say? Well, it refers to anything that God has said or promised or commandment, commanded. Now, when you read about how people got the word of God from when it was originally spoken, they got it from somebody else. It was passed down. Okay, that's generation to generation. That's in, their, in the families. That's the way that, Deuteronomy 6, that's what that's all about. Is the fact that impress these laws, impress these commands on your children and your children's children. So it says that there is a, there, so this is something, okay. So, so when somebody directly has an encounter with the Lord that I know, and that's and that that someone says this is my testimony this is exactly what god said to me and how god helped me now i am the second person to pass that on it does not negate that person's testimony all it does is enforce the fact that god is a good god and a great god and you ought to go over here and talk to so and so because that person has a testimony that I don't have. Although I know about that testimony, and since I do know about that testimony, I can give you my own testimony about the I am God in my life. And so, so this is a different word that means to say. It refers to anything God has said, promised, or commandment. And notice there are two words that are translated word. Okay, so now scripture is also called testimony. Let's jump into that because it is derived from a word that means to testify or to witness. So scripture is called testimony. When God has finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of his testimony. He gave him the Ten Commandments, that is, his, that is God's testimony to what commandments he wants followed. So he gave it to Moses and Moses had it, had it inscribed on two tablets of stone and he comes down to a rebellious nation that was going on at that time. You read the book and read what's going on right then. He comes down and he says, by the way, I've got the word of God in testimony right here. Pay attention to what it says. Because everything they were doing at the time was violating everything that God wrote down. Read it. Just read it. Idols, golden calves, everything. Everything was violating what he had given them in his commandments. And he said, and he said Moses, now, you are to take my testimony of what I want to be said, and you take that testimony, you take it to the people. Okay, so... It, the, in this, it views God as the source. Now, this is the thing that most of us don't, and this is what I like about the fact that the, that the Ten Commandments are jumping up all over again. Here it is. God is the source of all absolutes. When you, when you say that there, the Scripture is the testimony, this book is true. There is no error. There is nothing about this book that is going to contradict itself. It cannot do it because God is never going to contradict himself. And so it is a source of absolutes for your life. It's a source of absolutes. You say, well, I'm struggling with something. And I read this and it didn't help me. Well, just go find it in the book somewhere else. I guarantee you somewhere else in the book will be the commentary that you need to read. Don't go to man's word for a commentary. You go to where the book will commentate on itself because it will. And it will confirm itself in the entirety of its absoluteness, if that's a word. I have to go to my professor for that. I don't know if that's a word. Now, so it's testimony. Now, Scripture is called precepts. Scripture is called precepts. Now, we're getting into some heavy stuff here, guys. When, when, when we get into this, 
reading, you're going to get into the, where, where the word is used only in, it, by the way, the word precepts, the word uh, that is a Hebrew word that I can't even produ- pronounce, is a Hebrew word. It's only used in the book of Psalms. That's the only place that precept is used. And, and you think, wow, I've heard about precepts all the time. I've heard precept upon precept. I've heard that teaching. Well, that's great teaching. But the, but the point is, it's only used in the Psalms. And so, so uh, but here's what it means. It's the root meaning to visit or appoint. That's what the precept means. So let me try to explain this. It refers to a charge... Thus, anything that the Lord has ordered, it views God as the definer of duty. He is the definer of duty for your life. And you say, well, wait a minute. I'm I'm saved by grace. I don't have to work for my salvation. Got it. I understand. What do you do now? What do you do now? You go to, the, to, go to God who is the definer of duty for your life. And he'll define it for you if you will just pray and ask him to define it for you. He'll give it to you. He'll show you. It's a command. It's a rule of action. And, 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 and you may have heard the phrase, live your life precept upon precept. Basically, you have heard me say that. You walk in the last word that the Lord has given you, and you obey that until you're expe- until, and stop expecting a new word until you get the first precept done. And you think, oh, well, but I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of waiting on what the Lord spoke to me about. I got, I got news for you. It doesn't matter how long you're going to wait. If you try to circumvent the first word, if you try to circumvent the precept that God gave you, the, define, the definition of your duty, if you try to circumvent that and go another way just because you want to, it's not going to succeed. That is not the will of God. The will of God for your life is for him to define your duty and you go do it. That's the precepts. And oh my gosh, David, in all of his writing, he says, Teach me thy precepts, O Lord, that I may follow you. He doesn't say it once. He says it hundreds of times. This is a young man trying to figure out what it really means to follow God's definition of duty for himself. And that's what you and I need to understand every day of our life. What is the duty that I have today? What is the divine appointment that you have for me to God God today? What is it that I'm supposed to do? And I'm going to trust in the I am God to get it done. So scripture is also called statutes. I love this. I love this. The word comes from the root word that means to engrave. Statutes are engraved. Teach me thy statutes, David says, or the writer says, whoever it is. He says, teach me thy statutes. He's saying, engrave your word in my life so deeply that I will not forget it. That I, it, it won't leave me. He's, it's, it, and, and it also means that he has engraved something and it refers to something that has been prescribed. It views God now as a guide. He has been the diviner of duty. Now he's the guide of doing that. And he prescribes this. You've heard the, you've heard the word spoken many times. Or, order my steps, Lord. You've prayed that. Order my steps. This is the prescription. This is the statutes that God has set forth. Follow the prescription that I have for your life. The statutes are the prescription. And, and, and isn't this funny that most of us, and, and there might be nobody in this room that's exempt from this, most of us will follow the prescription of a doctor that he has given even if we don't even know if it helps us or not. We'll take, a, we'll take a doctor's prescription and say, thank you, doctor. Is this going to make me well? Yes, I think so. <laughs> what I've read in the manuals, if I give you this, this is how you're going to read. What I've read in the manuals. Come on, y'all. Come on. 
Now, not every time has the doctor told me, if you take this, it might react in a way because you're taking this. Not every time the doctor has told me that. Now, they're getting better about it. Too many lawsuits ha- hitting them, but that's the deal. They'll, they prescribe something and you follow it without, without even checking it out. We don't, we don't go online and Google WebMD and ask, what does this drug do? Yeah, I know. We, 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 when, you, when, you, when you've brushed death and cancer, Brother Dale, you check it out now, don't we? We check it out. Especially when I got sicker with something else. Come to find out that, the, by the way, you remember when I lost my voice after I had my surgery? Come to find out the drug I was taking, the, 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 one of the bypro, byproducts of that is, is, is that you could lose your voice. And I asked that doctor a hundred times, could it be something I'm taking? No, I don't think so. Now, here's, here's the point. God has given us a prescribed guide to go by. Right here. Okay? A prescribed guide. Oh, man. We're, we're going to have to move that camera because it's at a place. Oh, my goodness. It's at a place where there's a glare and I can't see the timing. And I'm just going to pretend that I can't see it right now because I'm going to go on. Anyway. Anyway, here we are. I'm on a roll here. Hey, Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a prescribed guide. You, you, you think, okay, well, that only has to do with whether or not you have children or not. Well, did you ever have children? Maybe. Will you ever possibly ever have children? I don't know. But here's the thing. This is a prescribed guide. Look at verse, look, uh, turn in your Bible. Deuteronomy 6, there it is. Get over there and look at it. Because there it is, it says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe, to, uh, to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess. Now they're about to get the freedom that God gave Moses to go do. And now they're here, and he says, I'm fixing to teach you what... You need to be taught so that when you go into the land, it'll, it'll carry. You'll carry it with you. Now it says, T, these are the commands. What are the commands? Re- read Deuteronomy 5. It's the Ten Commandments. Come on. My goodness. But when is the last time you read the Ten Commandments and you put all the subtopics with the Ten Commandments? One of these days, I'm going to teach on that one. But when it says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. What does that mean for you today? The command is, you just don't have them. The problem is, we all have them. We all have gods that are in the way of the I am God. And, 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 then, and then it goes on to say, you shall not make yourself for a, 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 in the form of an idol. For yourself in the form of an idol. Oh my goodness. What is, what is the possibility of anything that you have elevated before God? Every one of us need to be on our face right now. Because we're all in the same boat. We all have idols. We all have things that we have elevated to where God is. And unfortunately, we worship it. Money, cars, Ford trucks, Chevrolet trucks. Yeah. 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 See? Beer in the parking lot. Oh, I, I know. Never mind. Never mind. No, 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 listen to me, folks. You, you, you need to understand that God is doing a revolutionary thing in us by following his precepts and his statutes. 
if we'll learn how to do that. All right, then Scripture is called commandments. Okay, commandments. Now, what's the difference? Well, okay, as, as it is clear from the English translation, it refers to what God is demanding of the duty. Now, so he teaches the precept, he defines the duty, then the statute engraves that duty into our life, then the commandment is to obey the duty. So, so you think, well, that's all the same thing. No, it is not. Because we may get to the point to where while we're reading, we'll read something in 119 and, and something will speak to us. And, and, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the Lord speaks to us and he has engraved that word into our life now. It's something new that we didn't have before. We see it afresh. It's like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that. Oh God, thank you for showing me that. The next part is the commandment. The next part is to obey and do what you learned. And then scripture is called judgments. Well, this is the hard part because the word denotes a legal description. This is mishpah. Is what it's called in the Hebrew. By the way, commandments is is mitzvah. You know what? A, you know a bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah. You know, that's when you're 13 years old and you find out what the commandments are. I don't know why it takes that long for them to find it out, but they're asked. By, by the way, they're asked during a bar mitzvah to obey the commands. They are said, "This is what you should do. You should obey the commands." And so. You know, but, but they don't put the command that Jesus gave us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, that was a command that came later than the Ten Commandments. That's still a commandment. Oh, come on, y'all. I mean, it's a commandment. Jesus said it's the two commandments that are more important than the Ten. Wow. Do we follow that commandment? And so it's called judgments. It's a legal description word, and and, and it's the basis for Israel's legal system. This word, mishpah. And in Psalm 119, it refers to God as the supreme judge. You know what? One of these days, one of these days, we're going to face him. No choice. Believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you go to heaven, there will be a great white throne judgment. And in that judgment, you will stand before God. Now, I'm glad we're standing before a merciful God, a God full of grace. But it ain't going to feel good when he starts pointing out all the stuff where you missed missed the boat. The judgment will come. But the judgment is not death. You're already alive. You're already in heaven. But we will face God. We will face God. And there will be an accountability time. Then past that time we live the rest of... By the way, do you ever wonder why people say there's victory in Jesus and that you will live your life in heaven forever and ever and ever in victory? It is because... At the great right throne, God will say, you're not guilty anymore. Well, a charismatic church would be jumping up right now. Maybe in your heart, you're jumping up. The idea behind this is this. We will face that. So there will be a judgment. We need to understand that we're not under the curse of the law, but Jesus came to fulfill the law. So that didn't negate the law. See, we got to be careful with this sugar-coated cotton candy grace gospel. And you know how much I feel about the word grace and teaching on grace. I do it all the time. But we've got to be careful that it's not sugar-coated cotton candy. And you can just do anything you want to do. And because you're under grace, there won't be any judgment. Because there will be. There will be. Let's bow our heads.